good evening. Uh, it's really a privilege and a pleasure to have today with us in our 22nd session of in our webinar series, uh, Professor Faisal uh, Devji, a very well-known uh, historian and a scholar on Gandhi. And everyone is here looking forward uh, to listening to him. And we have people who have joined uh, from different uh, cities, different continents. Uh, just like in each one of our uh, webinars, there has been a wonderful response um, ever since we started in uh, early May. And uh, it's almost like four months, uh, you know, through 22 sessions of our Association of Asia Scholars, which uh, was registered in the year 2005. And ever since, we'll be completing 15 years, uh, exactly a month from today. And uh, over these 15 years, we have had opportunities of engaging with the most uh, eminent and distinguished scholars through various conferences, workshops, and uh, meetings which have been organized in India and abroad. Uh, several uh, publications that have been brought out as a result of that, which are all visible on our website, which is uh, asiascholars.org. And of course, uh, the flagship publication of our association is our journal, Millennial Asia, which is into its uh, 11th year. It's a sage publication receiving a lot of submissions. And uh, we expect that by, uh, you know, towards the end of next year, we hope to have this as a quarterly uh, publication because of uh, the wonderful responses that we are receiving from all uh, scholars writing on Asian issues. And uh, with these words, I'd like to welcome you all once again, and also a special welcome uh, to Pratyush Onta, our Asia Fellow, because all of us as Asia Fellows lived in another Asian country for nine months. And this was a fellowship uh, which was, uh, you know, instituted by the Institute of International Education in the United States and implemented through the Asian Scholarship Foundation over the years 2000 to 2010. So Professor Swaran, myself, and... Um, Dr. Pratyush and almost 300 others had the opportunity to avail of this wonderful fellowship uh, during that particular period. So uh, welcome Pratyush and of course a big welcome again to our speaker for today, Professor Devji. And I hand over now to Professor Swaran to take forward the proceedings of the session. Thank you, Professor Mawa. It's indeed a great pleasure because we are starting this first lecture on Gandhi as we have dedicated an entire month of October with five speakers on Gandhi followed by our international conference on 30th and 31st on revisiting Gandhi. So it's a great delight to initiate that process of trying to understand Gandhi uh, from various scholars, uh, from various perspectives. Uh, and indeed, I wish to also, like uh, Rina, acknowledge the uh, presence of uh, one of our Asia Fellows, uh, Dr. Pratyush Onta. Uh, also, my colleague uh, Manish Dhavade is uh, with us with a very floral backdrop, if you miss him where he's saying the screen. Uh, of course, uh, also uh, Professor Vern Wall from National Defense Academy, Karagwasla. Uh, several of you, uh, some of you are uh, visible to me on screen and others are perhaps uh, choosing to uh, not come on screen, which is your choice as of now. Uh, but as I keep saying always, uh, we always encourage those who can to come on screen uh, so that the speaker feels he's addressing a certain group of uh, people and could even see the response uh, in terms of uh, facial expressions as if we are sitting in a real room. Uh, but that's uh, completely your choice. Uh, most of you are, of course, uh, familiar with a very celebrated scholar that we have today, uh, Dr. Professor Faisal Devji. Uh, but uh, in case some of you uh, are not uh, quite familiar, let me briefly, very briefly, uh, though all of you can you know, go online and check more details, but uh, 
mention a whole uh, spectrum of uh, experience in his uh, education across the world in good sense. Uh, his undergraduate degree with a very, very prestigious University of British Columbia with double honors in history and anthropology, uh, followed by his uh, PhD from, uh, again, very, very famous uh, University of Chicago. Most of my colleagues and students know uh, that university because of several colleagues uh, we have known from there, particularly uh, Professor Mir Scheimer, one of our younger students once also uh, briefly taught there. Uh, what is more interesting is not just uh, physical uh, wandering around as he was, uh, you know, gathering his uh, skills and education. Uh, I also understand that Faisal speaks about nine languages, uh, among others, uh, the English, of course, that he will use to speak to us in French, Persian, Urdu, Gujarati, and uh, Swahili, and so many others I can't even remember. Uh, and of course, uh, he joined Oxford uh, more than a decade now, 2009. But along with uh, being a professor of Indian history uh, at the uh, University of Oxford, he also holds chair at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, and is also a fellow at the New York Institute of Public Knowledge. Uh, it is among his several other publications, his book of 2011, uh, very interestingly titled The Impossible Indian, Gandhi and the Temptations of Violence, uh, which is what introduced uh, uh, Faisal. Uh, only recently he has allowed me to address him with first name basis. Uh, I always addressed him as Professor Devji before. Uh, I teach a course in my university on peace and conflict resolution where two to three lectures are on Gandhi, which made me read his book. And that was my introduction to uh, Professor Faisal Devji. And of course, uh, I have known uh, him since then. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have him with us. And he's uh, very graciously accepted to speak to us on a very interesting topic again. I think I'm personally looking forward to listening to his uh, Gandhi as a critique of liberalism because most of us uh, uh, at least thought that he was possibly iconic last uh, uh, classical liberal himself and you know libertarian in some sense and uh, supported uh, most of the ideas that uh, liberal theories propounded and it's interesting then to see professor uh, faisal devji to speak to us on gandhi as a critique uh, of liberalism and uh, given the fact that many of us have close connection to either international political economy or international politics international relations uh, we are all uh, looking forward to really listening to your exposition on the subject today. And with that uh, brief introduction of uh, the speaker today, let me just close before, uh, let me just close by saying that we expect speakers to initially make remarks of about 20, 25 minutes, uh, but each speaker, uh, given uh, his own style, could take longer. And then, of course, we follow almost an hour plus of one-to-one uh, -one discussion, uh, which is each participant uh, could ask question to the speaker and given uh, a one-to-one -one answer on that. We don't like to bunch questions. So therefore, that part is going to be longer. Before I hand over to Professor Faisal Devji, let me also recognize the presence of one of my very dear colleague, Professor Nirmal Jinder. Uh, I am recognizing her presence uh, simply uh, because I know her, but also partly because uh, on this 2nd October, University of Delhi Vice Chancellor felicitated her, recognizing her uh, long-time work on promoting, on promoting Gandhian studies in the University of Delhi. Uh, so we are delighted to see Professor Nirmal Jindal with us, who is himself uh, pushing Gandhian studies in Delhi University, and uh, we look forward later in case she has some uh, comments uh, to make uh, on the discussion that we will have. But, let me now hand over uh, to Professor Faisal Devji, and I will hold my pen and paper and make sure I have notes to take as he speaks. I am so impressed with his book uh, that I think I am uh, going to sit like a student and listen to him carefully. Uh, over to Faisal now, and uh, please, uh, you can start your initial exposition. Thank you very much. I'm really very grateful to Professor Swaran Singh and Professor Rina Marwa for this invitation. It really is a pleasure to address you today, uh, not least because the subject is on Gandhiji. Uh, so let me begin by reminding you that uh, Nehru, uh, 
in his discovery of India has a section in that book on the two Englands. Uh, and the two Englands he's talking about, or he's, he wrote about were of course, the England of liberalism or of liberty, the England of John Stuart Mill on the one hand and the England that colonized India and many other parts of the world on the other. Now what Nehru wanted to suggest in that section of his book was that England needed to be true to her better self uh, and to expound the very liberal ideas that had formed her own national identity, uh, uh, expound them to others and, and, and uh, uh, attend to them herself abroad. Gandhi, by contrast, uh, thought that these two Englands were in fact the same one, that one was made possible by the other, uh, that the liberal England was made possible by English colonialism abroad and vice versa. Uh, he indeed thought that uh, liberalism in England and elsewhere in Europe uh, was established at least in part because it exported violence abroad to its colonies. Uh, and it did so in this pe peculiar arrangement of uh, the universal and the particular. Uh, in the case of the British Empire, of course, uh, the sort of maritime sphere of legal universality on the one hand, uh, and the site of the colony as one of exceptionality on the other. Uh, so it, it's the interstices between the logics, if you will, of liberal universality on the one hand, and the colonial exception on the other uh, that, that served as the site uh, for colonial violence. Now, eventually, this violence returned to the colonial metropole, uh, famously in the two world wars, uh, but even in a sense uh, down to our own day uh, with the end of the Cold War. And we know, for example, how um, uh, the arsenal of illiberal or exceptional and particular laws exempted from the universal, apparently universal logic of liberalism, such as humanitarian intervention and preemptive strikes and suspension of habeas corpus, uh, which are familiar to us over the last 10, 20 years uh, globally, all have imperial precedents. But the colony was not simply the site of a liberal exception, an exception to liberal universality. Uh, it served also as one of liberalism's principal arenas of operation. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this fact, uh, how it was uh, that ut utilitarianism, which arguably was the most important philosophical movement underlying British liberalism, uh, used places like India as a laboratory for itself. Um, whether this had to do with uh, the making of educational institutions, and there has been very nice work done on, on the way, for instance, in which English literature as a liberal subject is pioneered and experimented in India first, and then only then returns uh, to England itself. And this is work by Agori Vishwanathan at Columbia. Uh, there is also the very interesting and peculiar development of what we might call secularism in India first, uh, before it became an issue in England itself. Uh, and we know, for instance, that from the Queen's Proclamation of 1858, um, uh, religious equality was enshrined in Indian constitutional documents. Uh, and this was not the case in Britain. Um, in fact, it isn't the case in Britain even today to some degree because this country has an established church and the head of the state is also the head of the Church of England. Uh, so secularism too is pioneered in India, liberal forms of secularism. And there are many other ways in which India served as a site of uh, uh, liberal experimentation, um, in addition to being a, a place that represented an exception to the liberal order. Uh, so it's a, very, it's a very complex story. Now, what I want to do uh, today is to look at the way in which Gandhi, who I think is actually fully conscious of this complexity, in the story of liberalism, both globally or rather in the British Empire and its place in India, how Gandhi submits the what I take to be the procedural language of liberalism to a kind of extraordinary interrogation. And 
what I'd like to suggest is the categories that Gandhi focuses on in particular are, uh, first of all, interest, the idea of interest, uh, interest being the crucial uh, political category specific uh, to liberalism, uh, that uh, only those political um, agents uh, are understood to have a voice uh, who can be represented or represent themselves as interests or as interest groups. So interest is absolutely basic, the basic category. Uh, then comes contract, uh, and contract is of course very important because it is the chief way in which the relationship between interests is conceptualized. Uh, interests can only come into agreement through contractual means. But they do so, of course, by the mediation of the state, of the liberal state itself. Um, uh, so mediation is the third category I want to look at, or I want to argue that Gandhi submits to interrogation. And finally, the fourth one uh, has to do with the rights, uh, because the, uh, the, um, the establishment of interests is protected by a legal regime of rights. So interests, contract, mediation, and rights. These are the four categories which I take to be uh, crucial in the procedural language of liberalism uh, that Gandhi submits in various ways to interrogation. Now, Gandhi, as you know, because he's a political actor as much as, if you will, a thinker or a theoretician, uh, he tends not to write philosophical treatises, though you know, there is some element of that form in his work. So you have to gather what he says uh, from a variety of sources, including correspondence and speeches and uh, books such as his autobiography or uh, treat, uh, you know, a manifesto like Hind Swaraj and, and put them together. Now, uh, for Gandhi, as for many of his, or at least a number of his um, um, compatriots uh, and contemporaries in India, uh, interest uh, was a difficult category, not least because uh, in colonial terms, Indians were supposed to uh, not to possess it then in, in any fulsome way. Uh, so you know, either Indians were far too self-interested, uh, their interests were brutish and highly particularistic, or they were disinterested and oriental and sacrificial. Uh, you know, there was this kind of strangely Manichaean way in which this crucial liberal term, interest, uh, was both given uh, to Indians and taken away from them. And this, of course, is a reflection of the contradictory manner in which liberalism itself um, uh, uh, understands or uh, um, uh, makes itself at home in India, uh, which I described earlier. Now, Gandhi and some of his compatriots realized uh, very early uh, that the problem with interests is that they are made possible by property, uh, that whether it is physical or landed property or property conceived of in metaphorical ways, such as uh, the idea of your identity as your property. Right? So that without a regime of property, you could not really have interest as a category, as a political or intellectual category. And this indeed is uh, uh, what I take uh, philosophers like John Locke uh, uh, to be saying, a philosopher obviously, very important to English liberalism. What Gandhi thought was that it was precisely because most Indians were poor and deprived of property, and because capitalism was relatively new to India, uh, that property could not define social relations there, that property did not have a hegemonic role or form in India, and therefore, Indian social relations were not defined entirely by property, and therefore they did not take the form of interests or interest groups. Um, now, a number of Gandhi's contemporaries thought that this was a problem. Uh, they would rather that Indian society be defined by interests and therefore by property, and they did all in their power to make uh, that possible. 
Gandhi, however, thought this was actually a virtue. Uh, the, the very fact that property did not define social relations in India and therefore that interests uh, did not um, characterize social relations there meant that India could actually find her own way. Uh, that Indian social relations need not be simply pale reflections of English ones or Western European ones or American ones. Um, and this was in part because he thought that interests which in liberal thought uh, are the very basis of freedom, uh, he thought that interests actually were much more ambiguous than that. So as early as Hind Swaraj in 1909, he writes that look, one of the reasons why we were colonized by the British is because of our self-interest. We wanted the goods that they brought us. We came to depend upon the services that they provided us. It was our self-interest that allowed us to acquiesce in British rule. Uh, it's, uh, as it were, our own fault. You know? So those Indians who did have access to this kind of language of proto-language of interest. Uh, so he thought interest was actually not crucial for, say, liberty or indeed sovereignty, that it could be, it could perform exactly the opposite function. Uh, he also understood interests insofar as they existed in Indian society during his day as being um, possible only through an interface with the colonial state. So again, returning to Hind Swaraj, you will recall those of you who have read that text, how Gandhi inveighs against doctors and lawyers in it. Uh, and often this is seen as a sign of his eccentricity. It's not eccentric in the least. Uh, what he's saying is that doctors and lawyers serve as, uh, as the kind of linchpins of colonial rule, all right? Uh, how do they do this? Famously, the example he gives for doctors is that they are, of course, credentialized by the state, by the colonial state. Uh, and Gandhi tells us how it is that, uh, you know, someone who overeats goes to the doctor, is given a, a tablet and feels much better. Uh, but what immediately happens as a consequence is that instead of having self-control over his own appetite, uh, he, re he becomes dependent on the pharmaceuticals industry that is supported by the colonial state and its medical establishment. And therefore, his very comfort, as it were, uh, 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 reposes upon the colonization of his body. He becomes a dependent subject. And that's just a small example of how this occurs. Uh, and Gandhi could, of course, very easily have made the argument in entirely theoretical political terms, but he chooses to make a very everyday kind of example of it. Lawyers similarly uh, are there to, um, uh, like doctors, their power intensifies the power of the colonial state, uh, whose agents they necessarily are, whatever their own intentions might be in the matter. So what lawyers then are meant to do is treat uh, Indian subjects as interests um, and bring their disagreements into some kind of a relationship, but only through the mediation of the state, which they represent, the courts. Right? Uh, and Gandhi is very troubled by this because he understands this form of lawyerly mediation as being a way in which uh, no real agreement is possible any longer between different Indian groups or individuals. Uh, that uh, the imposition of a decision by a judge doesn't necessarily change the minds of either of the parties involved in the lawsuit. It simply makes the colonial state ever more crucial to Indian society. Uh, that the state depends upon these rivalries, which it tamps down, of course, uh, but in doing so, it prevents the unmediated relations between Indians um, that might have been possible in the past. So now Indians can only relate to each other at an individual as well as a collective level through the state. Uh, and the court, the system of justice is simply an example of this. So with doctors and this idea of uh, pharmaceuticals and dependency and loss of control over, over one's own body on the one hand, and with lawyers, 
where he brings in the triangular structure of the state much more, brings it in much more visibly, what you see happening is the making of interests, but only at the interface with the state. So what Gandhi argues is that for those who are not touched directly by the state, and that would include the majority of all Indians in his time, they really don't have much access to this language and logic of interests. And those Indians who do, do so at their peril, uh, that they become interest groups in such a way as to perpetuate the role of the colonial state, uh, which mediates between them. So if we are not to have interest, what are we to have instead? Um, and what Gandhi, of course, is interested in is uh, sacrifice. Okay. Uh, so if interest, of course, the primary interest is one's own self, one's own body, and if you will, one's uh, personality, um, uh, construed as a form of property, uh, sacrifice uh, is a way of thinking and a form of action uh, that depends upon renunciation, uh, the renunciation precisely of these kinds of property relations. Right? So you can sacrifice not only own property, physical property as Gandhi himself does, but of course you can sacrifice um, uh, your, uh, your comfort, your advantage, and indeed even uh, at the very extremity of this logic, your life uh, for others, um, for your country, uh, for your neighbors, uh, for your loved ones, uh, and for goodness, for virtue, and in the cause of nonviolence. Um, now, what has happened to sacrifice in Gandhi's view is that it has been perverted by interests in various kinds of ways. Um, so that he, he criticizes the terrorists of his time uh, of deploying sacrifice in the wrong way, right? that they, they do so for the, wrong, uh, for the wrong ends. But when he's making this argument, he's very clear that uh, the reason why sacrifice can be perverted is precisely because it remains so necessary uh, to social life, that social relations cannot really be defined entirely by interest. Uh, and we know this, all of us today, you know, um, we are all legal subjects and we all are in that sense, part of both individual and collective forms of interest. Uh, but we rarely tend to think of ourselves in this manner until and unless we have dealings with the state precisely. We sign a contract which is uh, guaranteed by the state uh, or we deal with the police or the justice system or you know, uh, uh, a question of inheritance or writing a will or et cetera, right? Um, otherwise, our human relations and social relations in many cases are meant to be based on the very opposite of interest. Uh, and for Gandhi, that is absolutely crucial, that interest cannot colonize all social relations, not even in England. And if it tries to do so, it will destroy the whole of society because you cannot understand the relations between parents and children, between lovers, among uh, family members, et cetera, et cetera, as being completely defined by interest. Otherwise, they, the family itself would break down uh, uh, you know, ideas of love, which inevitably depend upon notions of renunciation and sacrifice for the other would no longer be possible, et cetera. So what Gandhi wants to suggest is that there exists, there continues to exist even in the worst of circumstances, even in the most liberal of states, that nub of disinterested action, of non-liberal forms and non-interest driven forms of human practice, which he liked, he would like to expand. Partly because he thinks in India, the logic of interest has not hegemonized social relations um, in any case. Right? Um, now I can speak much more about that, but let me move on to uh, mediation. Um, now, as I was uh, suggesting earlier, the primary way in which interests relate to one another is through contract, a form of a contract as a form that is guaranteed by the state, either through courts or you know institutions of justice and others. Uh, and Gandhi, of course, is um, not very pleased with these ideas. Um, uh, he thinks uh, 
that um, what mediation does uh, is, as I said earlier, perpetuate colonialism. Now, how does it do that? Uh, partly because the colonial state, like the liberal state more generally, presents itself as a neutral third party uh, there to uh, mediate the relations of its subjects who can only be conceived of as interests. The state itself has uh, no specific interest, right? Uh, it represents the universal in that sense. And Gandhi understands very well that in making this claim, the colonial state actually is paradoxically more liberal than the British state at home. Uh, it is more liberal because it can claim to be a neutral third party more convincingly in India than it can in England. And it can do so in India more convincingly precisely because uh, the colonial state is a foreign state. It is run by foreign personnel or dominated by them. And therefore their very, as it were, alienness becomes a virtue uh, in this narrative. Um, for Gandhi, this form of mediation, whether perpetuated by a foreign colonial state or uh, indeed by a possible nationalist one, uh, is violent by definition because it disallows direct relations between uh, subjects uh, and forces them into the condition of being interests. Um, uh, and he also describes this uh, set of consequences by the uh, stereotype term divide and rule. And by the term divide and rule, he means not uh, that, you know, he doesn't mean that the British are deliberately conniving at separating different castes and religious and regional and linguistic groups uh, by playing one off against the other, though that may well have happened. He thinks this is a structural matter, uh, that once you set up this kind of liberal situation, of the state as a neutral third party and subjects organized into interests, you inevitably end up in a divide and rule scenario, whether it is in Britain or in India, much more so in India, because paradoxically India is, uh, despite a colonial status, status more exemplary in Gandhi's understanding, uh, a site of liberal dominance than Britain itself. Um, So he's very concerned with this, with the way in which this system disallows unmediated or direct relations uh, among, between Indians. Uh, so disturbed indeed that he's willing even to consider moments of violence as being um, more propitious for direct relations than this system of interests and contract. Uh, right? um, as early, I think, as Hind Swaraj, he argues, for instance, that the reason why you have communal riots in India is precisely because uh, Indians no longer have any sovereign power. Uh, they are simply interest groups. They have been reduced to inter interest groups uh, who have, therefore, the luxury of mutual violence. Uh, because they know that they're not responsible for picking up the pieces afterwards. Uh, that if you were to actually invest Indians with more responsibility, or in other words, sovereignty, you would see a decrease of this violence. So you, I mean, I offer you that example to show how he turns the colonial reasoning on its head, right? The colonial reasoning is Indians are just like this, and it's precisely because they're deeply violent that we need to be there in order to hold them apart and to serve as this neutral third party. Uh, and we need to, as it were, deprive them of their sovereignty. Gandhi has the reverse idea. He thinks that's precisely because they've been deprived of sovereignty that they turn to violence in this manner as a form of luxury. And for him, uh, um, other forms of violence might therefore act as a kind of interesting uh, for restitution um, you know, let me give you an example of what I mean. You know, when in 1948, uh, Nehru takes um, the, the recent India-Pakistan war, the first one over Kashmir to the United Nations, Gandhi is full of disapproval. Uh, he thinks that uh, 
what will happen is that the United Nations uh, will serve simply as a replacement of the British colonial state, uh, posing as a neutral third party and turning Indians and Pakistanis now, as opposed to Hindus and Muslims, into interest groups, which can only relate to each other through this international body. Uh, so he's not in favor of mediation of that kind, even though it is international mediation. It is not, of course, the mediation of a colonial state. Uh, Gandhi preferred instead war. And you might think, how curious, how could the apostle of nonviolence prefer war? Uh, and there are many reasons I can give you why that might be the case. One of them being that for Gandhi, life is not the, the most important moral category, it is truth, satya, that is, uh, you know, so he's willing to discount life. Of course, he does not want war, uh, but should it come to that, uh, he thought in 1948, that since no one had listened to him until then, and that got to the brink of war, you might as well get, go through it to the other side. That would be, a, if you will, a better option for nonviolence itself. The battlefield could just as well serve as a site of nonviolence uh, as any other place. Um, this is, of course, the kind of thing he uh, gets from his interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita, which, of course, occurs on the site of the battlefield, famously of Kurukshetra. So, um, but I can return to that in the questions if it is of interest uh, to anyone. So Gandhi is willing even to prefer what he calls anarchy and civil war in 1947. He was, of course, against the partition of India. And he thought that it was better even to tolerate that violence, which might offer up a more plausible site uh, for its opposite, for nonviolence and for agreement without mediation, uh, without the mediation of the colonial state or the transfer of power on the one hand, and in 1948 without the mediation of the international community on the other. And who is to say he wasn't right? Um, since you know the, the, the conflict going on now for more than 70, nearly 75 years uh, between Pakistan and India has left the entire subcontinent open um, to violence um, uh, and to the, um, uh, to the interference of outside powers. Um, so in the long run, you know, I just wonder that Gandhi, who is dismissed as an idealist, might actually have been uh, the more realist of the two, uh, that is to say, between him and Nehru. So let me move on to um, contract. More specifically, I was uh, talking about mediation. For Gandhi, contract uh, is necessarily a transient thing. Um, and something that is not accidentally, given the um, uh, origins of liberalism uh, in capital uh, or in capitalism, a commercial form. Right? So Gandhi finds it difficult to understand how a commercial instrument, what he sees as a commercial instrument largely, and one that is transient because interests are transient, um, can really form the basis of anything. Uh, durable. He's not saying that you should have no contracts. He's suggesting that contract cannot be the inescapable or fundamental basis of, of social relations, either domestically or internationally, and human relations more generally. Uh, and he's constantly refusing contract for sacrifice, as I suggested earlier, and the interests that are made possible in contract to the relations of friendship that are made possible or love that are made possible through sacrifice. And I'll give you an example of that, uh, which comes from the aftermath of the First World War and the Khilafat movement. Uh, and you know the Khilafat movement is an effort uh, initiated by Indian Muslims to um, uh, protect some of the Middle Eastern territories of the Sultan of Turkey, which were being uh, claimed by British and French colonialism. Uh, and Gandhi joins Khilafat. Indeed, he becomes its leader. And um, this has not sufficiently been um, taken into account. The fact that what turns out to have been the largest pan-Islamist movement ever had as its undisputed and declared leader a Hindu uh, believing 
pious Hindu, uh, and he was put there by Muslims themselves. Um, so already Khilafat is an interesting movement. And what Gandhi does is he supports it. Both Hindu and Muslim leaders had come to Gandhi and said, look, we'll make a deal. Uh, uh, you know, if Hindus will support Muslims if they gave up cow slaughter, which was a particularly um, uh, a difficult subject in, in his, uh, in these day, in Gandhi's day, as in our own, uh, and, and Muslims said the same thing, you know, we will give up cow slaughter if you support the caliphate, and Gandhi said, on no account. This cannot be a contractual relationship. We cannot build a nation out of a contract. Uh, so unlike his uh, rival Jinnah, who was an inveterate believer in the social contract, Gandhi was against it. Right? Jinnah's entirely, entire politics is based on contract, on contractual agreement. He was a true lawyer in this way. For Gandhi, a contract was commercial and it was transient. And what he thought was important about the Khilafat was that Indian Muslims were sacrificing their time and efforts and money for a cause which seemed to have no uh, particular benefit uh, of an economic or political kind for them in India. Uh, so he understood it as a disinterested and sacrificial movement. And he urged Hindus to partner with Muslims in order to make their own politics sacrificial and disinterested and out of friendship and sacrifice. Um, and indeed, Muslims did give up cow slaughter during the Khilafat movement. Um, so what you have happening, it's, it, the Khilafat movement is important because it serves as the most, as, the, as a kind of crucial exemplar of mass politics, indeed the first example of mass politics in India, the first example of mass politics for which these relations of interests and contract are not material in Gandhi's view, are not germane. Right? Uh, he says, if Muslims are willing to give up cow slaughter, they must do so at their own discretion. Uh, and they can invite you know, Hindu friendship as a result. Uh, and similarly with Hindus sacrificing for the caliphate. And the crucial point is that they need not believe in each other's causes. So unlike a contractual relationship where you agree on stuff that you, as it were, agree upon, here, that kind of agreement, uniformity of agreement is not necessary. Uh, so the, uh, Hindus do not have to believe in the caliph as they do not, and Muslims do not have to believe in the sacredness of the cow as they do not. That is not the issue. Uh, and only in this manner are the cow and the caliph comparable entities, precisely because they are in fact not similar. They cannot be reduced down to similarity. Similarly, Hindus and Muslims cannot be reduced to, as it were, equivalent interests. You know, the thing about the logic of interests is that each one is meant to be the same as the other. Uh, there's a logic of equi equivalence. And Gandhi doesn't have this kind of equivalence. He has equality of a different kind. So I offer that simply as a, as a kind of illustration of how Gandhi thought politically and in political practice about a non-contractual and unmediated form of um, social relationship. So let me end then with rights, uh, which are meant to protect uh, interests. Um, in 1947 or 48, um, uh, Julian Huxley, who is um, director of UNESCO, writes to Gandhi. And he writes to Gandhi because he's writing to a number of people, including Albert Einstein, uh, as the UN is putting together the document that will come to be the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And Huxley asks Gandhi what he thinks about rights and Gandhi writes back and says he doesn't really think much of them. Um, he's much more interested in duties instead. Um, he argues that rights, though they are meant to be or said to be inalienable are in fact the most alienable of things because they are both given and taken away by the state. They can be taken away by the state. Um, they are also generic in the way that interests are meant to be generic and equivalent. Right? Whereas duties cannot be given by anyone, nor can they be taken away. They are your own. The kind of duty swadharm that Gandhi is thinking about, he also gets from the Gita, of course. It's, the, it's a duty that you discover yourself, and it's not generic as it was not generic and 
in, uh, in classical Hinduism either because your duty is very specific depending on who you are. Are you a man? Are you a woman? Are you an adult? Are you a child? What ashram or what stage of life are you in? Depending on all these things, your duty is different, right? Uh, so you need to figure out what your duty is and your duty can never be taken away from you like a right can. Uh, it always belongs to you. And whereas the chief right is the right to life, as we know very properly, the chief or most extreme duty is always the duty to die, to sacrifice. Right? Um, and what Gandhi does is foreground duty, not in order to get rid of rights. He thinks that both must exist together. Uh, neither one can, or certainly rights cannot exist without duties. Right? So now his foregrounding of duties as opposed to rights is, I take it, a foregrounding of disinterest and sacrifice um, as set against, you know, interest, uh, mediation, and contract. Um, and with rights, he, he, you know, he, uh, he allows his critique to get to the very, you know, the kind of almost a subterranean basis of all these terms we've been talking about, which is to say life and death, the most crucial things. Okay. Uh, and what Gandhi argues is curiously, the emphasis on life and its promotion that is linked to interest and contract. After all, uh, interest as self-interest has life as its uh, presumption, right? That that world defined by life of interests and contract, all these things that are meant to promote and protect life uh, are actually doing the opposite. Uh, that they, not only does that world of thought and practice ignore social and human relations that fall outside its remit, which are sacrificial and disinterested, uh, but also in its own right, it embodies a regime of violence. How is this? And I'll end with this. Um, he makes this argument in 1937 uh, when he's visited by someone called Rudolf von Strunk, who is one of Hitler's henchmen, uh, who was coming from Spain. He had been in charge of supplying weapons to the fascists in the Spanish Civil War. And interestingly, he stops in India and comes and visits Gandhi, it's in, I think in Sagaon and, um, and Varda. And he is interested in health, as fascists are. Uh, and Gandhi is interested in health in a different way, of course. Um, and while they are talking, um, you know, Strunk says, oh, it's terrible, the violence of the civil war in Spain. And Gandhi says, no, you don't understand. What I admire about Europeans is the fact that you're willing to throw away your lives. That really is true virtue, that's sacrifice. You know? But the violence doesn't come from that. The violence comes from the fact that you want to protect life, that you want to preserve life, your life at the expense of other lives. He talks like this not only about war, uh, but he goes back to his older uh, concerns with medicine. And this, of course, is what uh, von Struck was also interested in. He said, look, you are interested in medicine to protect your own kind against others. And you are entirely willing to destroy the lives of others for your life. Your forms of medicine also work by the destruction of subhuman life. He's, of course, talking about experiment, experimentation on animals. Gandhi disapproves of experimenting on animal, animals for the you know, benefit of human life. But when he mentions the term subhuman, he may also have been thinking about the human beings, such as Jews, who were declared to be subhumans by the Nazis. Right? So uh, he understands that this language of health, life, and the, their promotion actually resides upon the dehumanization of others and the destruction of other kinds of lives, both human and animal. Um, uh, and in these ways, he privileges, if you will, death and sacrifice over life and rights. Um, and, um, it, you know, this discussion of the underlying basis of, I guess, practically all our political categories, at the very end, they come down to death and life, do they not? 
uh, when Gandhi gets down to those bases, uh, he is clearest uh, in what he thinks. Um, and he thinks that liberalism as a form of protecting life and promoting life through interest and contract and mediation and the role of the state certainly has its place. Uh, but it is a place that must be limited because it cannot account for the totality of social relations on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is a place that also offers a kind of refuge for violence. And it is that violence that Gandhi is interested in addressing. So I shall stop there and uh, I'm happy, of course, to take questions. Thank you, Professor Devji. Uh, very intense, uh, very few lectures. Uh, and today is the 22nd session we have. Uh, have been as intense, maybe uh, given the fact that we relate to Gandhi in a very, very different fashion. Uh, given the fact that you have done enormous work uh, of great uh, quality, uh, with great clarity, a very intense uh, exposition of four central pillars of liberalism, uh, mediation, interest, uh, contract, and rights, and how Gandhi uh, looks at them and sort of uh, presents a very nuanced picture, even in, in undermining uh, the liberalism the way it is presented by European or British traditions. Uh, to some extent, uh, I think there was also enormous satisfaction uh, the way you presented it in seeing that alternative uh, being presented uh, which is so deeply grounded in in indian ethos and uh, that clearly brings your you know enormous training in history and anthropology uh, how uh, an ordinary indian and how indian uh, civilizational traditions uh, are kind of the grounding on which the thought process of Gandhi is uh, then connected. Uh, of course, at the same time, fairly cosmopolitan uh, in, in engaging European debates. Uh, uh, I have taken a full page of notes, as I, as I said, and I'm sure they'll come very handy to me personally to explore uh, uh, you know, many of these areas that you just underlined. Uh, the discussion will now open. And as I often uh, say, uh, given the limitations that we have uh, in a platform like the one we use uh, online, uh, I will be privileging people who I can see on screen. Uh, so if there are people writing something in the text, maybe I will miss them. So let me uh, request you again, as I always do, that uh, maybe you could switch on your videos if it is possible and all of you perhaps uh, perhaps are familiar with raising the e hand that will show on your window on my screen and i know you want to make an intervention and some of you if you are not able to do that then just as i say physical hand just raise your physical hand and i most likely will take note and i'll note your name also uh, we have already a request from uh, prince surya vanshi and uh, i don't see him on my screen as of now. Please, uh, would you like to uh, switch on your video? Otherwise, I'll go to the next person who's requesting here, Ruchi Sharma. I can see Ruchi Sharma is already on my screen and I think she's switching on her video. I can see her now. Uh, so Ruchi Sharma, please introduce yourself after unmuting and then make your intervention. A very good evening to all that delegates uh, it was a very interesting session thank you fazil sir i'm very delighted to hear from you this is ruchi sharma from delhi university satyavati college i'm in graduation second year and uh, i would like to ask you that uh, regarding the mediation which you took uh, after the idea of interest the contracts and the third one you said that uh, Gandhiji was against mediation and uh, I was very curious to know why he was in favor of war as he was a staunch supporter of non-violence and during his last breath also he went to Bengal and Delhi to settle down the mishappenings. So can you just uh, speak about it? Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes, I mean, you know, as I was uh, suggesting, um, he's not 
uniformly against mediation. He just thinks that uh, mediation uh, turned into an absolute funda absolutely fundamental and basic and indeed as the only way of thinking about uh, the relations between uh, conflicting or contrasting uh, individuals and groups of people uh, was both unrealistic and uh, deeply uh, threatening to those social relations because it insisted on forcing everyone into the language of interest. And he thought that was not possible in India or indeed uh, anywhere else. And that mediation disallowed for direct relations, right, unmediated relations. And he thought that sometimes violence um, was better only insofar as it represented the perverted realm of those direct relationships that had been uh, otherwise set, try to set up an ambulance score for service on the Western Front as well. Um, and in the end, he returned to India, he even recruited soldiers for the army, the British army. But he did all these things for rather distinct reasons. Uh, and if I give you an ex a couple of examples, you'll see what I mean. Um, in all of these cases, these offers were unilateral, they were gifts. Uh, you know, the colonial state often presented itself as a kind of gift giver to its subject. Uh, uh, you know, that colonization was a kind of gift, or law and order, rails, all, all of the things. And their obligation was created in interesting ways, just as when he uh, decides to um, raise an ambulance corps in, 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 in England, uh, he thinks that once the war has occurred, as the, you know, once the First World War occurred, for instance, what should he do? He was in England. He says, shall I just, uh, whether I'm fighting or not, if I'm not fighting, I still depend upon the protection of the Royal Navy, that my sustenance, my livelihood, depend on violence done in my name, whether or not I am fighting. So I cannot be like a pacifist and just withdraw and say that I am virtuous. That would be the comparable phenomenon. I don't want to fight my relatives and my preceptors or on the other side with the Kauravas. Um, and just as uh, uh, Lord Krishna says to Arjuna, you don't have a choice um, because whether you leave or you stay, you are responsible for this violence. Uh, if you leave, if Arjuna leaves, one side will win. And if he stays, another side will win. So he is responsible whatever he does. Uh, similarly, Gandhi thinks that he and all Indians are responsible. Uh, and therefore, in order to negate this responsibility, the virtuous thing to do when a war looks like it, is, it cannot be um, uh, uh, stopped is actually to participate in it in such a way as to make nonviolence possible even within it. Uh, so an ambulance corps that treats the wounded from both sides is one way. Of course, the other thing that is being done is that by putting himself at risk without killing, what Gandhi is doing is, as it were, in a karmic fashion, atoning for uh, or canceling out the benefit he receives of his own food and his protection from the Royal Navy, from other people fighting in his name. So you put yourself at risk to cancel out, if you will, the bad karma that you're getting from participating inadvertently in a war. So these, and, but I might add here that the thing about nonviolence is, you know, when we think about war and peace, we think about war and peace as being absolutely uh, exclusive um, categories, right? Where there's peace, there cannot be war, and where there's war, there cannot be peace. Uh, Nonviolence is not like peace. Nonviolence, unlike peace, is a negative category, uh, ahimsa, right? Uh, both in Sanskrit and in English. Uh, and this allows it to occur everywhere. Unlike peace, which cannot intrude into the realm of war or the vice versa, nonviolence can occur everywhere in Gandhi's view. And it can therefore occur on the battlefield just as it did in the Gita, in the Mahabharata. Um, so for Gandhi, the important thing about nonviolence, and it is the negative 
the category of nonviolence that allows this to happen is that it is the only mode of thinking and practice, anti-war mode of thinking and practice that can have an effect even during a war, even on the battlefield. And that is what is crucial for him. So yes, he's an anti-war figure, but he understands that sometimes you cannot control when a war breaks out. And the question that you should ask yourself then is what am I to do now? He, like Arjuna, he dismisses the, the possibility of simply withdrawing uh, from a war because you are still responsible for it. Somehow you must participate in it, even if you're not fighting, in order to allow nonviolence to operate. Thank you. Uh, I had a uh, brief text conversation and Prince Surya Vanshi wants to ask the question, but cannot uh, switch on a video because the video is not functioning on his device. So I have agreed to allow him an audio question. Uh, if you are able to hear me, Prince Suravanshi, please uh, ask your question, but you please introduce yourself uh, before you ask your question. Yes, if you can hear me, just uh, sure, speak yes, out, sir. speak now. Uh, thank you, sir. It yes, was a very insightful and uh, uh, insightful session, and it gave a broad perspective towards liberalism and uh, Gandhism ideology. Sir, I am Prince Urenci from Satyavati College, second year political science. Sir, I have a slightly different question. It's related to 1918 and 19 pandemic. Around that time, also we had to cope with pandemic situation, and Gandhiji was in India. That time, how Gandhiji and India battled against the pandemic, and what can we learn from 1918 flu? Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. I'm not sure I can answer the question <laughs> because I don't have the details of Gandhi's um, uh, dealings with the uh, uh, plague. Pandemic. Uh, except, of course, to say that um, he was deeply concerned with health, as we know. Uh, and uh, many of his experiments were indeed experiments in health. Um, and he tried, and, and these experiments, of course, were, were all premised upon the fact that the search for health had to be one that was not premised upon the destruction of other lives, either animal lives or other human lives. And that health was important not as a kind of um, uh, benefit or property. Uh, Just this issue of pandemic. Uh, uh, let me now request uh, Professor Nirmal Jindal, who I mentioned was recently on 2nd October felicitated by Delhi University for her promotion of Gandhian studies. Uh, Rajendra, would you like to say something? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Swarn Singh. Uh, Professor Faisal, very interesting talk. Uh, there are a few things, few observations that I want to make. Uh, one is that uh, uh, this, uh, on the issue of violence. I think when uh, we talk about, when in India also, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of controversy about uh, Gandhi's support to British uh, 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 Empire in their fight in the First World War or the Second World War. And uh, here the, uh, you know, one of the arguments is that uh, because Britishers were on the defense, uh, because they were, uh, you know, attacked by the aggressive or the, uh, you know, Axis powers, and that's why Gandhi supported. And uh, Gandhi was, uh, you know, really uh, supporter, supportive of the liberal values, democratic values, but the only uh, problem was about the capitalist system. He didn't accept uh, the British capitalism, and that's why he didn't even consider them as democratic, because uh, this capitalist system was so exploitative, and, you know, it, uh, this created colonialism, imperialism, and all the countries in the global south, they were victim of this capitalist system. Otherwise, the political democratic values, he agreed, but he had different conception of, you know, democracy, welfare state, secularism. And there, you know, uh, he really wanted Indians, you know, to uh, 
you know explore the indian civilizational and cultural values and that's why you know when we talk about uh, that how interest doesn't uh, provide the basis of our relationship it is a virtue you know the concept of soul and super soul and why we cannot consider anybody else as different how he considered the entire world as a global village because he never considered muslims as different or any other community or any other culture or caste or any of course he have, uh, accepted the caste system in indian uh, social system but we find that his uh, thinking was very different and he wanted indians to understand the indian civilizational and cultural values and so what the violence is concerned in the end he stated that uh, using violence for self defense is also non violence because if you don't use violence just because you are coward that is the non violence of a coward so if you use violence for self defense that is the non violence of a brave so i think this uh, uh, here we have to understand gandhian concept of swaraj decentralization of power and what was suitable to the indian system and one of the arguments or one of the misperception of, uh, uh, of most of the people about gandhi is that he was uh, against development he was against modernity he was against you know western uh, westernization i think he was not against development but his understanding of development and modernity was very different and his idea of spiritualism his idea of uh, you know uh, uh religious value cultural values all those things you know he valued those things uh, more and he thought that they were more suitable to india so i think your talk is very interesting and you have very clearly demarcated uh, that how uh, interest uh, he never accepted interest as the basis of uh, relationship in indian society he considered virtue sacrifice and these kind of values and it was definitely based on indian uh, culture and value system thank you very much thank you very much yes i couldn't agree with you more in fact just to add um uh, you know this um, issue of supporting the empire you know as i suggested uh, he was in one sense trying to return the poisoned gift the poison chalice uh, that indians received from the empire as in the name of a gift he was giving them a real gift and the gift was important because after all as you know better than i um the aim of non violence is not to defeat your enemy it's to convert your enemy um it's to have your enemy agree with you um and so this was really important now in 1918 when he's recruiting troops you know as long as he was conducting you know setting up an ambulance corps people could understand it because after all there's no fighting involved uh, you know there's a kind of sacrifice involved but once you're recruiting soldiers then of course you know there was a great pushback uh, but how gandhi justifies it is really fascinating he has several levels of argument that he makes because he understands that not everyone is the same so he will speak in one way with one set of arguments to those who believe in non violence as he does and using slightly different but not uh, incommensurable arguments to those who believe in violence but think that you know non violence is a strategy or something so you know on the one hand he's offering the british this kind of gift uh, but he also thinks that you know indian troops on the front can actually learn the virtues of courage and sacrifice uh, so that they are meant he's not interested in who wins or loses the war this is fascinating both in south africa and in the first world war in the second world war he is interested because he's against the nazis uh but in the first world war uh, uh you know he's he's not concerned with the war in the way that the warring countries are concerned with it right he has his own reasons and that's what i find fascinating his ability to participate in a great global event but in doing so to to transform what it means right so one of the reasons he gives for recruiting soldiers as he says to people like annie besant right or tilak look whether we raise soldiers or not because the viceroy had asked indian leaders to recruit soldiers he said the british are recruiting soldiers anyway and they are volunteers you know the indian colonial army was always a volunteer army it was not conscripted all of these people are going to go and fight in europe they will then come back and what we will have in india is a large group of men with armed uh, of armed men or men with training military training whose sole allegiance will be to the colonial state 
we will then have military rule in India if we even try to become independent. But if we raise the troops ourselves in a national cause and for the purpose of nonviolence, when they return, they will be loyal to us, to civilian Indian leaders, uh, not to the British Army and not to the British. So this is a kind of argument that could appeal to people for whom nonviolence was also, you know, who didn't themselves believe in nonviolence. Yet without betraying Gandhi's idea of nonviolence, I would say he was very skilled in these ways of thinking. Um, and I offer this simply as an example of the way in which even acts that appear to be uh, from our time uh, incomprehensible, like how could he recruit soldiers for an army in the first place? And secondly, how could he recruit soldiers for the British army, for the colonial army? Uh, that Gandhi already had answers to these. Um, you may not believe them, but he had, in my view, uh, quite good answers, which you have to engage with. Uh, and that it is not uh, uh, possible to simply dismiss him as a kind of uh, someone who was pro-imperial one, you know, in his younger days, and maybe we can forgive him for that. I don't think he ever was in that sense. Uh, he had a very uh, distinctive argument uh, to justify uh, all his um, all his various ventures. So, just to add to what you had to say, uh, I will go next to. Navanita Sen, who now I can see is on my video screen. So please go ahead and ask your question. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Swaran sir. Good evening, Fazal sir. And good evening, Reena ma'am, and everyone present there. My question is how Gandhi's critic of liberalism affected Indian independence at his time during 1947? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's quite a, that's a very big question. Uh, and perhaps one way of approaching it is to cite a book. You know, the late professor, Chris Bailey, Cambridge professor, um, C.A. Bailey, wrote a book on Indian liberalism uh, called Recovering Liberties. And in it, he argued that even though people like Gandhi mounted a very strong uh, critique of liberalism, after independence, uh, it was the liberals, in fact, who took over, uh, you know, that they, it was the liberals who ended up forming the institutions of the state. And among those, he includes, of course, uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, to say nothing of Nehru himself, who, uh, before independence, had to play second fiddle, as it were, to Gandhiji. Uh, but once he became prime minister, uh, he reverted to his earlier stance as a liberal. Uh, and it's an interesting argument uh, because, uh, but not because uh, it tells us of Gandhi's failure, on the contrary. Uh, you know, in 1947, by 1947, Gandhi understood uh, that though he himself was a kind of uh, philosophical anarchist, he wanted a very minimal state uh, and he wanted society to run itself almost. Uh, through its existing institutions, uh, which included some form of caste, um, that this was unlikely to happen. Uh, so what he wanted was, uh, and remember he's, he himself promoted Nehru as, as India's first prime minister, and indeed Dr. Ambedkar, uh, though he disagreed with them on fundamental issues. Uh, and I think this is a nice example of Gandhi's democratic attitude, uh, that he was willing to have dealings with those whom he disagreed with on various grounds, because he understood that it could not all be one way, uh, that it is important to have in, you know, by the end of the Second World War, the nation state was the only form possible. Uh, you know, so you had to have uh, a proper nation state uh, that needed to be safeguarded, whose sovereignty needed to be um, uh, 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 protected. Uh, and of course, he was not against liberal virtues. Uh, but in addition to that, he wanted to have a social space there for the working of sacrifice and nonviolence in an exemplary fashion. So we know, for instance, that a number of 
uh, people, especially women, interestingly, who went into Nehru's cabinet came from the Gandhi, from Gandhi's ashram, right? Sushila so Nair being one of them. Uh, but he tells all his colleagues in the ashram, those of you who want to join the government, please join the government. As for the rest, we will be working from now on in constructive work uh, in society, and we are not going to have any joined up relationship with the government. The government works according to its logic as it should, but we are here to work according to our logic and the two can work in tandem, but they must never be confused. And that is what his successor, Vinoba Bhave, tries to do. Uh, and he, he does, if you will, most um, uh, importantly in the Bhutan movement um, uh, later, later on after Gandhi's assassination, obviously. So Gandhi is willing to consider the establishment of a liberal state uh, as long as it doesn't completely hegemonize all social relations, which he thinks is both violent and indeed uh, impossible. But you know, even early on, he had quite interesting debates. You know, so for instance, uh, when um, in the 1930s, when the issue of women's rights, of women's rights to inheritance. Uh, come to the fore in the courts, there's an interesting uh, correspondence between um, Rehana Tayabji, who is one of Gandhi's disciples, and Gandhi. And Rehana Tayabji says to Gandhi, writes to Gandhi and said, it's wonderful women should have equal rights in inheritance. Um, and Gandhi responds to her and says, I agree that women and men should not, should be completely equal under the law. There should not be any inequality between men and women. Nevertheless, he says, what do you want when you ask for property? I remember Gandhi is a critic of property. Uh, that the fact that people might not have access to property is what makes them, as it were, disinterested. Uh, you know, they're not, they not constituted into an interest group yet. And he thinks women are not, uh, by and large. And so he harps on these old, which these visions of feminine virtue, which of course today are uh, uh, understandably considered patriarchal, the sacrificing woman, you know, etc. Now, for him, what's important about these ideals is that they represent a site of disinterestedness and sacrifice. And so, even though he would, he will not tolerate legal inequality between men and women, he at the same time doesn't want to lose the capacity of disinterest and sacrifice. The problem, of course, is that he places all the weight uh, of disinterestedness and sacrifice on the weakest sections of society. Uh, but he does this knowingly. So whether it is women, whether it is lower castes, uh, whoever it is, it's they who are meant to represent the ideal. Um, but it remains a contradiction. So he, as I, I said, he agrees with Rehana Tayabji, uh, but at the same time, he regrets the fact that uh, women's rights should be solidified simply by their inclusion into a masculine world, which he thinks is unjust already and unjust by definition. So he says to her, okay, you want property, but who can actually have property in India? Very few, only, you know, 1% or something of Indians actually have property to inherit in the first place. Um, and you, what you're asking for is women to be included in masculine power. Um, yes, I agree that there should be equality, but is this really the way to go about it? Should we not actually think about redistribution or something? Isn't that a better way of thinking about it? So I think that's a, a good example of the con of the ambiguities uh, that are present in that uh, in that moment and in the relationship between liberalism and, if you will, disinterest. Thank you. Other than uh, this narrative about the post-independence outcome of independence in terms of uh, uh, nature of polity or social reformation, uh, I think I want to also you know uh, maybe ask you. Uh, about the very process of independence, given the fact of this complex engagement that Gandhi has with British liberalism and the whole series of acts of 1919, acts of 1935 and transfer of independence uh, act uh, 
that process uh, was that impacted upon the fact that the main leader of Indian liberation movement uh, was not really willing to take that benefaction of the British elite you know, of what kind of transfer and outcome is to be achieved. Did that also impact the process of independence? Yes, I guess. I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, because perforce, you know, Gandhi couldn't always take everyone with him, and he understood that, which is why he had different levels of argumentation, as I tried to point out, you know, in his uh, justification of recruitment in 1918. Um, by the time, and therefore what he had to do is also deal with the consequences of these major constitutional advances uh, or interventions that the late colonial state made. Uh, you mentioned them, uh, Swan, and, uh, and the Government of India Act 1935 is only the last of them. Uh, you know, and a lot of that become, gets embodied in the constitution of uh, independent India, as we know. Um, so he has to uh, engage with, uh, with this highly legalistic and, if you will, liberal way of doing things. Uh, not only can he not always take his own party with him, there are other parties as well in the country uh, that uh, have to be dealt with. Uh, so he certainly um, does compromise, uh, but he does so from the very beginning. You know, this uh, attitude Gandhi has of, um, you know, he'll stop the great movements, the, you know, whether it is uh, um, non-cooperation or civil disobedience, the satyagrahas are stopped from time to time so that he can enter into negotiations with the state. He eventually goes to London for the round table conference. So there is a fulsome engagement with the very things that he criticizes and he understands that this uh, is necessary. But I think what he also wants to do is to see how this world of legalism can be limited um, and his experiments run along, if you will, that cleavage, you know, between the, the world of the liberal uh, uh, order on the one hand and the world of disinterest and sacrifice and nonviolence on the other. Um, now, whether that was a successful thing or not, um, you, you know, opens up, that's a question that I certainly cannot answer except to say that like it or not, uh, Gandhian attitudes and activities remain crucial for India and for many other parts of the world, even if you consider them to have been defeated, that you cannot think of the women's movement in India or the ecological movement in India without thinking about Gandhi. Um, because they both have been sacrificial in that manner and disinterested in that manner especially the ecological movement, obviously, um, where it is the disinterestedness of the human species itself that, that is brought to the fore. Uh, so in that sense, it was not a failure at all because you cannot think of new movements of this kind in India um, without Gandhi. Uh, and this is also, I think, the reason why Gandhi has come back into fashion, if you will, or circulation globally. Um, it's largely through environmentalism and things like that. It's, it's no longer through anti-colonialism. You know, uh, it's a different Gandhi we are seeing, but one who was already present in the 1920s and 30s uh, and 40s. And I would say even at the time of independence, the time of the greatest violence, you see also the greatest victories of Gandhi. Uh, now we know his famous fast that stopped violence in Calcutta, right? Um, as also in Delhi. Um, and uh, you know, he let me give you a couple of examples from it. Uh, so, in the violence in Kolkata, you know, at one point Gandhi had fasted to make sure that not only was the violence stopped, but that people, Hindus and Muslims, would return to the neighborhoods from which they had been expelled. Um, uh, and at one point, this is a story from Nirmal Kumar Bose. It's a wonderful, luminous book called "My Days with Gandhi." And he was an anthropologist who worked with Gandhi in Bengal. Um, and he uh, basically tells the story of how at some point uh, a, a number of sort of 
what today you would call Hindu nationalists, I suppose, come and ask uh, Gandhi, look, uh, we believe what you have told us, but we need arms because in case our own people come back uh, to attack the Muslims whom we have promised to protect, we need to actually fight them off. And Nirmal Kumar Bose thinks Gandhi will say no, uh, but Gandhi's delighted. He says yes, right? For him, it's a, it's a pure instantiation of the war of the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna is willing to fight his own relatives. At the same time, in Kashmir, you have, of course, the insurgency, insurgents coming from Pakistan. And what you have is Sheikh Abdullah and the Kashmiri Muslims rising in, against the Pakistani invaders who are also Muslims, like they themselves are, and they protect Hindus and Sikhs. And for Gandhi, too, this serves, it's an exactly equivalent instance from Calcutta, right? Of sacrificing your own for the cause of a minority or your neighbors or whoever of who be, might belong to other religions. So even within the violence of partition, you see these kinds of things happen. And of course, Gandhi's last fast in Delhi, uh, he starts receiving letters from India and Pakistan by people telling him, please call off your fast, Bapu, you know, all the rest. And when he does, the violence stops on both sides of the border. And of course, once Gandhi is assassinated, the, vi the partition violence stops permanently. Now that is truly extraordinary. So even at the moment of his greatest failure, what you see is arguably Gandhi's greatest success. And I think he knew this, <laughs> you know, uh, he understood this very well, that at the end, his own life was his greatest sacrifice. And it was a sacrifice that brought peace uh, to India and to the region. Thank you. <laughs> I noticed that we have uh, roughly around 27, 26 minutes, uh, the time you mentioned to us. And we have a, a good number of questions still lined up. So we'll try to be a little more precise, uh, perhaps now. Uh, so maybe we'll go next to uh, Dr. Silky Kaur. Dr. Silky Kaur, if you're able to hear me, please unmute and uh, ask your question quickly. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful talk. Myself, Silky Kaur. I have recently been awarded PhD from JNU under Professor Swaran Singh <laughs> and I am currently associated with us. Sir, as Martin Luther King said that we must pursue peaceful and through peaceful means. So my question to you is that where do you see the role of today's mass media in increasing violence and aggression? Uh, is it really a peaceful means for the peaceful ends? in the sense how it perpetuates a psychological violence in the society. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. That actually is a really quite interesting and important question. And I think uh, provide the perfect example of the kind of things Gandhi said. Uh, so, you know, we tend to think of media as being um, because, uh, because media appear to be uh, focused only on the relay of information, we tend to think that violence is not a part of it. Um, and of course, uh, there can be a problem with, with fake news and uh, incitement and all the rest. And in Indian history, there's a, you know, uh, you know, there's a long uh, trajectory of that sort of thing with censorship and bannings of various kinds as in other parts of the world. Uh, but in general, we have tended to place violence outside the world of information and media, uh, which is seen as being simply inciting, you know, that you say, yes, you can hold uh, newspapers or radio or television stations responsible in some indirect way. Uh, uh, but I think it should be clear now that things are much more ambiguous uh, in our day um, and that it is, the relationship between mass media in particular um, and violence uh, outside the you know, newspaper offices and television and radio stations on the other uh, is much more direct uh, than we would like to think. And clearly the way in which we tend to think about in, in good liberal fashion about this issue is uh, uh, with regards to 
issues of censorship and free speech. So how are we to uh, regulate media in such a way as not to compromise uh, the principle of free speech and when might censorship be necessary and all the rest. In India, of course, these things go all over the place uh, because, um, and you have criticisms, whatever happens. Uh, so you know, on the one hand, when there are particularly weighty pronouncements by the Supreme Court, for instance, we nowadays often see that even WhatsApp groups are, you know, I mean, internet is cut, et cetera, in order to prevent the spread of, uh, of news that might prove injurious, right? Uh, and many liberals are for it. Uh, on the other hand, paradoxically, they are not for other kinds of censorship um, about novels and paintings and things like that. So I don't think that there really is a joined up or a, how should I put it, a, an integrated and comprehensive argument uh, that already exists to take into account these all these kinds of exigencies. And I think that is a real problem. Um, now, Gandhi himself was very critical of newspapers, which are the big media of his day. Uh, radio, of course, was also there in early newsreel footage, but it, was, it, uh, it, it didn't have mass um, implications in Gandhi's day. Uh, but already in Hind Swaraj, he's very critical of newspapers because he thinks that newspapers are there simply to peddle the, as it were, interests of their of the political parties or the groups in whose uh, benefit they were um, published, the owners who published them. So that problem has been with us for a long time and it is by no means uh, only an Indian problem. I just wonder whether it might be possible to think about the problem without being bound up in knots over the issue of censorship and free speech. Uh, because we have seen all over the world how both censorship and free speech can be used for illiberal ends. Uh, so they no longer represent only one side of an ideological or a political uh, divide, if you see what I mean. It used to be the case we used to think that free speech is where liberals stood and censorship was where authoritarians or illiberal people stood. And today that is clearly not the case and it is certainly not the case in India. Where as I pointed out, liberals can stand for censorship in various ways and authoritarians or non-liberals can stand for the reverse. Uh, so there must be a way in which we can, make, we can disconnect those two things um, uh, and, and, and see how an argument might be mounted uh, that allows us to address this kind of violence. But the violence certainly is there and Gandhi was very clear that the violence he, uh, he thought about and spoke about and wrote about was not simply physical violence. Um, it was violence of, all, violence of thought, word and deed. He, he used these terms himself. Um, and each one of which can lead to any of the others. Uh, so there must be a way in which you can think about these things holistically as well. Uh, and that implies going beyond the kind of liberal presupposition of free speech versus censorship and free speech is liberal and censorship is not. And then of you know speech being somehow less violent than other forms of violence. So because a Gandhian, I think, would connect all of these things up, first of all, uh, and secondly, not rely so, um, if you will, abjectly on this fundamental distinction between freedom and unfreedom. So I'm sorry, it's not a direct answer, but you know, I think these are the lines along which we might speculate. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I have still names of people like Ramzan Sheikh, Dipanko Kamai, Jalpa Shah, uh, Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar and uh, Ghazala Faridi. Uh, I apologize. I will give priority to people I'm able to see on screen because that assures me that you're with me. Uh, I'll go next to uh, Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar, who's a faculty at National Defense Academy in Khadakwasla. Please unmute yourself and make your yeah. introduction. 
uh, sir a very good evening to you actually i i am just uh, struck off with the, some of the things you have uh, spoken about the gandhi because uh, uh, it's really beautifully structured uh, you know thought process what you are uh, you have delivered today and i need to you know listen again to make a clear understanding of what you spoke about actually only one thing i i'm not able to understand is like uh, we when we talk about the gandhian philosophy still it is relevant in the 21st century i agree with that but when we see the liberalism as a reality and it it uh, moved towards the majoritarianism don't you think that uh, it's a kind of a double uh, you know uh, threat to the gand relevance of gandhian philosophy in the recent time because i personally feel and i was discussing this thing in with one of my colleague in the department today also that gandhi as a philosophy sorry to say that, that has been subject to the you know branding a kind of uh, you know concern that we take only one part of it like we totally focus on swachh swachhta abhiyan in india as on today but we forget the overall dome of spectrum made by gandhi in philosophy which is so much relevant to the all walks of life for the governance and for the people as well so how do you see this kind of changing dimension of threat to the relevance of gandhian philosophy thank you so much thank you yeah i mean i um i agree in that uh, i mean today famously uh, we appear to be at a time when liberalism seems to be under threat uh, in the all over the world so what we have like the the magazine the economist kind of you know arch uh, proponent of liberalism for decades and decades more than a century um feels the need in our day to defend liberalism to actually set in place a whole project that is meant to defend liberalism uh on the other hand you know, so the mood if you will on the uh in the center to some degree and on the left as well uh is to circle the wagons about liberalism and to protect it rather than to criticize it so you know when you talk about something like gandhi's critique of liberalism um because liberalism itself seems to be by itself professed voter is under threat uh, there's not that much willingness to listen to it uh but i think these circumstances um provide even you know all the more reason to listen to critiques like gandhi's uh because he understood the deficits and the problems and the contradictions of liberalism to some degree now he was not the only one uh, obviously there's a leftist there's a there's a marxist a critique a very strong marxist critique of liberalism and there's a right wing critique of liberalism as well um and but gandhi gives us something quite different because he doesn't really fall in either of those places um the the you know uh, he he's certainly not a marxist though he uh, he learns a lot from um, lenin in particular actually he says this he's quite interested in um, someone asked gandhi once what he thought of lenin and uh, gandhi's answer was that i would begin where lenin ends which is to say with the withering away of the state uh, but of course this is the anarchist part of gandhi you know he'd rather have no state at all uh, so uh, uh, since i think gandhi is an interesting figure through which you can think about liberalism precisely because he doesn't fall in the usual political and ideological categories that we are that we think about you're either left or you're right or you're center right some bits of gandhi are on the center some are on the right some are on the left uh, but if you take him as a whole as you were suggesting he appears to be almost sui generis except he isn't because he claimed to represent in his own person ordinary people ordinary indian people and so he did in many ways uh you know he um, i always think to myself you know the kind of um, slightly batty eccentric and cranky indian uncle type person and we all have people like that in our families that's the gandhi that we all have in ours uh you know slightly uh, and gandhi called himself a crank you know an eccentric and all the rest he poked fun at himself so he was very clear about placing himself within a tradition yes there is a philosophical tradition but he was more interested in the everydayness of non violence you know this is something everyone in fact does all the time that we only are alive and we live together because of non violence uh 
and we only have such relations of love as we do with our families or whatever because uh, we don't consider ourselves only in terms of interests, right? So it's from the everyday that Gandhi starts and that everydayness is still with us. So I think the critique must come again from the quotidian, um, uh, not the quotidian as a kind of protected sphere, you know, which has not been affected by anything else, on the contrary, uh, but rather is something which still gives us some ground, some room uh, for hope. And I think that, um, uh, you know, as far as, um, uh, I mean, Gandhi's critique is not one that necessarily wants to dismantle liberalism and throw it away. Uh, but it's a critique that allows us to see, as I've been suggesting, liberalism's limits, but also its capacities and its strengths. You know, I wouldn't want to live in a world where there are no liberal freedoms. Uh, right? uh, so, uh, and even if you move to a Marxist world, uh, ideas such as equality, of course, Marx rethinks it, uh, but they have been fundamentally liberal ideas in the past. Right? So it's, uh, you're not getting away from that. And I don't think Gandhi thinks he's getting away from it entirely either. So I would say it's a, it's a, it's a critique that is much needed, as much needed, especially today. And Gandhi is as capable of offering such a critique as anyone else, precisely because he cannot be placed easily on the spectrum of ideological and political options that we have available to us. And the problem, of course, has been that people have been all too willing to confine him to one of these places in that spectrum. Um, but it's really very difficult to do. And again, to reiterate, by this, I'm not suggesting Gandhi was a superhuman person who is so sui generis that we, there's no one like him. That would be a, a, well, an untrue, but also a highly problematic thing to say, because that means there would be nothing for us to learn from him. It would just be what he has become, as you suggested, sir. Uh, you know, a, a kind of icon that we put up on our, uh, you know, shelves and we can worship him from afar, but he doesn't mean anything in our lives. The whole point is that Gandhi was like all of us and was like everyone else. And that's what he aimed to be. That's the position from which he spoke. And I think that's the position to which we need to return. Thank you. The, the next question will be from Dr. Ghazala Faridi. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your deep analysis. My name is Ghazala Faridi, and I teach at the Department of Political Science in Southfield College, Tajling. Though partly you've already answered my question in response to uh, Dr. Nabunita Sen's and just now uh, Dr. Bhushan's uh, question, but uh, still, uh, sir, uh, so would you say that since individual is consider, individualism is considered to be the core of liberalism, then Gandhi's critique of uh, liberalism does fall automatically uh, because of his uh, attraction towards community values. And also for India at that point of time, and even now, highlighting a supporting sacrifice and love instead of uh, self-interest rights of every individual can be not only inherently discriminatory, but also dangerous as the social context is such that it, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that it supports certain sections, as you said, certain weaker sections to be making that sacrifice like women and scheduled caste. And uh, most so that uh, change in such cultural spheres does not happen through a change of heart and does require some legal backing and force. So would you say that Gandhi's views were based on a more idealistic version of human beings uh, which did not exist then and does not exist now. Thank you. Thanks, a very well put question as well. Uh, I suppose I would say that, yes, of course, Gandhi is fully conscious of uh, groups and collective uh, identities. Uh, and he doesn't think you can get rid of them, nor does he think that you should get rid of them because that would be a recipe for, in some sense, tyranny. All right. Uh, remember when Gandhi begins the non-cooperation movement, he relies upon groups uh, because inherited groups, caste groups, religious groups, village groups, linguistic groups, etc., were the only ones who possessed some measure of autonomy in colonial India that they could uh, renounce. Right? They could enter. Uh, into non-cooperation. They could refuse to cooperate as groups. Uh, 
if you only had individuals defined by the state, then you had the makings of a tyranny, especially when the state was owned and possessed by a colonial power. Uh, what might it be to identify or mobilize as an Indian in such a circumstance where you could only mobilize through a state that was owned by someone else? Uh, instead of that, you could mobilize along your village lines, along caste lines, along district lines and religious lines, etc. And it was the very multiplicity of uh, Indian social relations that Gandhi relied upon. So what we tend to see often as a weakness, you know, there, there are too many differences. Gandhi saw as a strength, and he saw it as a strength, not just, uh, in, you know, to be moral, uh, that because, you know, it's a, he didn't do it just to make a virtue out of necessity. Uh, he really saw it as a strength because only India's diversity allowed something like non-cooperation uh, to come into being because people could non-cooperate in group terms because they were already organized. Even if they were organized only in terms of castes and communities and the villages and all the rest. And they were cross-cutting. You know, there was no identity that was singular. Right? You might belong to uh, one religion, but another caste, but another village, but another language, you know, so it's, there were constantly, uh, all these identities were cross-cutting identities. So that, you know, one thing. So yes, he placed great value on these groups because purely having individuals would be a recipe for tyranny. On the other hand, of course, he didn't want to get rid of individuals either, uh, right? And the whole, uh, point of Swadharma is that it is not simply your gender duty or your caste duty or it is your individual duty that you must, like Arjuna, you must find out on your own. Uh, so, you know, even Arjuna's brother would not have the same duty necessarily. They might still fight in the war, but for somewhat different reasons. So if you can imagine Yudhisthira being, uh, you know, in that chariot with Lord Krishna, you can imagine a rather different conversation because Yudhisthira is not Arjuna, you know? Uh, so uh, in that sense, even classically, there is a kind of weight placed on the figure, the autonomy uh, of the individual. Um, and it's the kind of autonomy, however, that is not necessarily manifested in liberal terms of individualism, you know, with an ISM at the end of it. Um, which is of course linked to interest and self-interest and contract and all of those things. Uh, and Gandhi often thought about the individual in terms not of voice. You know, when we think of interests and politics based on it, we think of voice. We raise our voices, we make our voices heard. Gandhi thought of it in terms of silence. Uh, and silence was there, you know, he, he had his weekly days of silence, he advocated silence and all the rest. That silence was there to do two things. It was to protect the individual from being taken over by the cacophony and the noise of the collective world, of the world of groups. So there, somewhere inside you, you should have your freedom, you know. Uh, but silence is also there to protect that society from you, from your noise. Uh, um, and he had many interesting examples of, uh, of this. Um, uh, but let me give you one, which I think is, um, um, it gets to the nub of the argument that I've been trying to make, you know, so, and this might seem at first glance to be a religious example, but in fact, it's a properly philosophical example as well. Uh, you know, when Gandhi is thinking of uh, cow protection, for instance, you know, he taught, now we normally think about liberalism in terms of, as I was saying, voice and contract and interests and all of these things in which we presume that there is an understanding, that there's a language in common, that there are things in common. Gandhi looks at the relationship between humans and animals, right? And says, look, the thing about this relationship is that it forces the human to go beyond itself. And this is how he sees the cow protection, but not just cow protection, the fate of all creatures. Right? Uh, you cannot have a language with the animal. You don't share a language, right? Um, you don't therefore have contractual relations with it uh, or interest relations in that sense. Nor are there biological relations of the kind that groups have with each other. 
right? You don't, you don't have commensal, you're not eating with them like, you know, cats eat or do not eat with each other. Uh, you're not, you don't share a food culture with animals except indirectly. Uh, you don't share sexual and reproductive relations with, with animals like human beings do with each other, right? And you don't share language, which is the thing that defines both humanity classically and politics. It's all about language and voice. Uh, and precisely because of this, Gandhi makes it the ideal moral and potentially political relationship. It is unilateral, all right? Uh, so you, your attitude towards the animal is one that cannot be shared by that animal. Uh, it is unilateral, just as nonviolence should be unilateral. You don't doing, like in the Khilafat movement, Gandhi is saying, we, don't, we are not gonna make a deal out of this. This is not a contract. So with the animal, there's no deal. You don't expect the animal to do to you what you are doing to the animal, right? You decide you to care for the animal purely unilaterally as a gift in that good sense of the non-contractual sense, right? Um, and, uh, the, you, and, but in doing so, you actually go beyond yourself. All right? And that is the important point for Gandhi, that this is an example if liberal language and liberal contract is about similarity and similitude and biological relations and contractual relations and interests and all of these things, which actually are all about limiting things. It's me, myself, or it's my group, and it's people like me, and it's people with whom I can talk, et cetera. The human animal relation is fascinating because none of those things apply and it forces the human to go beyond his or her own species. Um, and it's that radical openness uh, that Gandhi really values. Um, and that in a way, uh, you know, I offer as a, as a kind of closing example because it shows you how um, both how Gandhi's thinking moves into ecology uh, really quickly, right? because it takes into account the non-human, uh, but also how it offers that, it offers a very traditional thing, cow protection, in its nonviolent mode, I might add, um, as an exemplary practice or in which your individual responsibility and your group responsibility is not bound up with drawing lines around, protective lines around yourself. In fact, it does the opposite. It opens you up both as an individual and as a member of a group to something completely external and something outside with which you can have no converse and with which you can have no agreement, but you still have an obligation towards it. Uh, so, you know, I haven't laid it out. I cannot in, in this frame of time lay out and, you know, Gandhi's view of the individual, but I think that might suffice as a good example of, um, of how he thought about uh, how we thought about it. Thank you. Uh, we have still four names, uh, but I don't see them on screen. So I think I'm going to use that time to ask my own questions very quickly, two questions. One that Professor Devji, you uh, a couple of times referred to caste without, uh, there was no direct question, so you didn't elaborate on it. I've been recently reading a couple of articles uh, claiming that Gandhi supported caste system almost till 1920s when he shifted to uh, talking about Varuna system. In his uh, autobiography, he mentions uh, his encounters uh, with Christianity when he goes to Johannesburg, 1893. Uh, and there's a Mr. Coates who takes him to church for prayers. And recalling that, he mentions about his uh, belief in the irrelevance of multitudes of castes. Now, of course, he's recalling a sentiment of 1893, but he's recording that in 1920s in his serialized uh, autobiography. Now, I wanted to see how you have kind of interpreted that in terms of both, uh, in terms of the timeline as also uh, Gandhi's understanding of caste and varna. And very quick, because the second question is like the question you were asked about Gandhi's view on pandemic. Uh, recently, you know, the fact that India has been celebrating 150 years of um, Gandhi's birth, 151st year actually, uh, 
uh, and we have been also having these five months plus tension on the border which i so repeatedly it's a question that you may like to even ignore but uh, in case you can want to say something how would have gandhi responded to border tensions in china in fact this is also uh, the question that came in the text but it gets very often asked uh, that given that india's now preoccupation with border and we are celebrating gandhi's 150 years how would have gandhi responded to a situation like this in case you can also take that question please thank you very much on caste of course uh, well both are very big and important questions um you know even when he first got to south africa um and when he first experienced racism there gandhi immediately linked racism to caste violence in india you know so he he tells the very you know uh, gujarati merchant uh, figures whom he was there to uh, work for uh that uh you must see the discrimination against yourself as a punishment for or a reflection of our own discrimination against uh fellow indians who belong to a different or lower caste so he immediately makes that connection already in the 19th century um and he says in his autobiography and this is available even in, in documents of the time rather than the autobiography which as you say is from a much later period but in his autobiography he then tells us that he stopped feeling bad about this you know when he was thrown you know i mean when he was moved off a pavement or thrown out of a bus or something he, he said you know that this is of course it's unjust uh but we must realize that or we must un, we must understand it morally as a punishment for our own acts that we too perform such acts uh, in india and therefore we must not be surprised so already there is an act of identification going on there which is very very interesting uh in which it is caste difference that is being negotiated right and of course we know eventually he he moves on from the gujarati capitalist class to defending the indentured indian laborers who are the majority of indians in south africa who all came of course from much lower castes but who belong to different religious groups primarily uh, hindu and christian um now when he is um, uh, back in india of course he engages much more fulsomely with caste initially as i was suggesting in response to another question because he thinks of caste as being a part of um an inherited part of indian society which required reformation but which he was not comfortable with willing out of existence so and for gandhi this was important precisely because he was interested in the plurality of indian society and he treated caste in that sense very similar to the way in which he treated village or religious community all right that these were all forms of collective identity and forms which allowed for collective action uh that already existed and they existed with in all cases with great amounts of violence within them but of different kinds and those of course that of course needed to be addressed but he was in this sense a conservative thinker you know he didn't uh think that you should abolish anything uh, uh he was happy to reform now his critics like dr ambedkar of course with uh with very great reason on their side thought that you couldn't really reform this stuff you know you, you either had to abolish it or you know you were uh supporting caste in some way so they they had they certainly had a difference uh on this uh ground uh and the other differences when you consider caste as a religious category i've been talking about it now as a social category in the same way as a village might be considered a social category or a Uh, you know other kinds of groupings uh, so gandhi thought about caste at more than one level at one level what i'm calling is a social category it stood alongside religious groupings and sectarian groupings and village groupings and districts and all the rest and at another level when he's uh, thinking about hinduism in particular uh, caste occupies a slightly different kind of place because there of course it is about restitution and justice and the return of the gift of another kind i have described the gift 
as a colonial logic which Gandhi radicalizes by returning it. In terms of Hinduism, of course, he thinks about, and Ajay Skari has made this argument, that he thinks the role of upper castes towards lower castes is seva, is service, precisely because they have been receiving the service of lower castes uh, throughout history. Uh, so now their only relations with the castes hitherto seen as being lower than themselves must and can only be seva. Uh, so the relationships are not equivalent. Whereas, as Karya tells us, the relations between Hindus and Muslims in Gandhi's view were to be defined by mitrata, by friendship, because they were seen, at least in uh, colonial India, as being equivalent uh, groups of people. Um, so here, too, you see this ability of Gandhi's not to think generically. Now, that might also be a way of thinking like caste person, you know, because caste is not a generic thing either. Uh, that you have constant differentiation. And in that sense, uh, Gandhi does something with the language of caste and transforms it. Um, uh, of course, there's a lot more that can be said. You're right that he ends up thinking about Varna more than he does about Jati. Uh, and he eventually is all for intercaste marriages. Indeed, he only attends weddings which are intercaste weddings, uh, Gandhi and Kasturba eventually, refuse to attend other weddings at all. And it doesn't matter what the religion is, it's the caste that matters. Um, uh, but he never gives up on, partly because he is a conservative thinker in this sense. He thinks that revolutionizing society and trying to abolish bits of it is a recipe for tyranny. Um, and so we must do what we can um, and indeed, what we must in terms of reforming ourselves, uh, but not by as if we're wiping the slate clean. And his, his big question of, to Ambedkar is precisely this, and Ambedkar understands it because in the annihilation of caste, when Ambedkar prints that, of course, he's not allowed to deliver that lecture. And he prints Gandhi's response, which is fascinating. Um, and Gandhi basically says to Ambedkar, if you are not a Hindu, who are you? Uh, what are you to be? What are you to become? Uh, do you want to forever hold an identity which you yourself think is an abject identity? Um, or do you want something else? And I, Ambedkar sees this as a taunt, but I wonder if it might, I don't discount that, but I wonder if it might also have been a serious question. Um, which Ambedkar goes on to address by his own conversion uh, later on to Buddhism. Uh, and in, of course, c turning to religion, he strangely mimics Gandhi, um, who, who, had already, who had always been a religious thinker. And in leaving Nehru's cabinet, uh, he also strangely mimics Gandhi, who also stayed out of, who had stopped being even a member of Congress um, in the, the mid-1930s. Uh, so I'm not saying that Ambedkar is imitating Gandhi in any way. He's clearly um, uh, the most important rival Gandhi has, intellectually speaking. But even Ambedkar acknowledges Gandhi insofar as he continues to word, he used a term like Satyagraha, which is indubitably Gandhi's term. Uh, and Ambedkar continues uses it until the end of his life. And he knows it's a Gandhian term. Uh, he uses it. Nevertheless, so there must be a way in which we can think about these uh, altercations, these allegiances, and these conversations as part of a single uh, set of dialogues without reducing them all to the same thing. You don't have to say that Gandhi and Ambedkar all ended up agreeing with each other. They didn't, but they did have a conversation, and that is what is crucial. Um, uh, so that's as far as caste is concerned. Of course, a lot more may be said about it. Um, ab about China, I imagine, uh, as with India and Pakistan, you know, the story I told you about the UN, uh, I imagine Gandhi would be very keen not to involve any third parties, not to involve the United States, not to involve the UN, uh, to have a direct demarche with China uh, and you know perhaps 
you know, a determination, but also good faith. And this would be an invitation to the Chinese. Um, the recognition that what is required is an agreement uh, and mutual respect. Um, now that may not be a successful thing, but it is surely something that needs to be done nevertheless. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, it is precisely China's fear of third parties, um, you know, India's al alliances with other powers outside Asia uh, that, you know, are in part behind uh, some of the things that are going on. Uh, because to conceive of the two largest countries on this continent as being at loggerheads um, is not a cheering prospect for anyone in the world, not least uh, for India and China. Uh, so uh, I can say no more than that, that you know, India's, and, and uh, Swaran, you will know, of course, better than I, uh, India's doctrine of strategic autonomy um, is so crucial here and its sovereignty is so crucial, something for which all Indian governments without exception have fought uh, to protect and preserve. And Gandhi too, uh, though he distributed sovereignty individually and in groups, uh, made of Swaraj, if we define Swaraj as sovereignty, um, absolutely crucial to all moral and political life. Uh, so I would, I guess that's what I would say. Uh, and India has been very good at gestures, uh, um, certainly gestures towards China in the past. Um, so I don't see why it is not capable of any in the present, um, while of course backed up uh, by a, a inf in, an inflexible, uh, determination to preserve and protect and maintain its sovereignty. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been absolute delight, uh, a treat uh, to listen to Professor Devji. Uh, in fact, that's not just my sentiment. Uh, I'm looking at the text messages and several participants are using choiciest superlatives to express their praise about the intensity of presentation by Professor Faisal Deji today. Uh, I am myself uh, so deeply impressed. I need to improve my own understanding of Nehru, <laughs> of uh, Gandhi, I'm sorry. I'm so moved I'm saying Nehru instead of Gandhi. <laughs> uh, I need to work much more on my own understanding of uh, Gandhi. Uh, amazing lecture. I think it's really good that we could uh, afford to have you with us to speak to us today. Uh, hopefully somewhere down the line next year or somewhere we might request you again to come back. Uh, maybe our understanding of uh, Gandhi would have changed by that time and we may ask you still more interesting questions uh, next time when we have such an interaction. Uh, with that I will now hand over to my colleague uh, Professor Rina Marwa to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of all of us. Uh, Professor Marwa. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pezal Devji. I think you have addressed uh, not only uh, the subject of how Gandhiji, uh, you know, sort of uh, told us and shared uh, his vision of uh, not only, uh, you know, society and societal structures and uh, the relationship between the state and the individual as well, you have really taken us through a range uh, of uh, emotions, subjects, narratives, and uh, ideals, and bringing us right uh, to the present. So really, we have uh, no words enough to thank you. And I'm sure this first lecture on Gandhiji has really been a treat uh, for each one of us, because as we move uh, and make progress uh, towards our conference, on 30th and 31st of October. Uh, this, is, this has really been a brilliant um, and, and wonderful treat uh, to have heard you and your experience, your in-depth 
insights, very valuable indeed. And there are so many takeaways for each one of us uh, personally, and I'm sure collectively as uh, each one has given us their feedback. So we are really deeply indebted to you for taking out so much time and for indulging with us in this uh, absolutely brilliant manner. Thank you so much. And we really look forward to having another interaction with you sometime early next year and wish you all the very best. Our uh, next webinar, uh, next Wednesday, also we have another Gandhi and eminent scholar and uh, he is from the United States. So that would also be next Wednesday in the evening, same time. And uh, our speaker for next Wednesday is uh, Professor Paul Biono, Dean Ms. Quieter. Uh, he is Professor and Director, Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies from the University of Rhode Island, uh, Kingston, uh, the United States. So we look forward to your valuable participation again. To all our viewers and participants, thank you so much for joining us and for your wonderful questions, which really uh, you know, brought forward such a wonderful debate and discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, thank you so much, Faisal. It was great to have you with us.